This is a customer appreciation event. Thanks for being such awesome early adopters to Perpetua and Instacart advertising. We're excited to continue to grow with you and continue to grow with Instacart. And without further ado, I'll let Craig take over. Well, thank you very much, Adam. We have a bit of a history. We kind of go way back in Adam being a fan of uh, the work that I've been doing uh, at some of the restaurants that I've helmed and started throughout uh, the last decade in Toronto. And I'm just excited to connect and cook and share some uh, insight into how to make a really amazing dinner with really simple ingredients. And with the restaurants being closed, this is, this is, this is the fun that we get to have. So let's get into what we are gonna be making tonight. We're gonna do two dishes, one of them being a bit of a signature of mine, right? The burrata with roasted grapes on garlic crostini. Uh, you know, burrata cheese is, is a fantastic, fresh mozzarella style cheese from Southern Italy that, you know, comes in its own way, freshly made. And uh, it's the back, just like the backbone of that dish with these warm roasted grapes. The second thing we're gonna make is a mushroom pappardelle. I love mushrooms of all kinds. I love fresh truffles, but even when you take the simplest mushrooms like cremini or oyster, and then these are my taki here, very simple, you can create a really beautiful pasta. And this is unique because it's a pasta that's made without any prep ahead of time. There's no extra sauces. We're gonna build this flavor in the pan and we're gonna boil our pasta and use some really interesting techniques to make this rich and velvety and absolutely delicious. So as I mentioned, about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes ago before we got into this. It's important that we all have our ovens preset for toasting bread and toasting grapes. And we've got a pot like so, um, something that's got a bit of height to it so that we can build sauce uh, with a lid. Not even important that we have the lid, but that we've got a pot of water on. So my water's kind of boiling and simmering and I have nothing in it, so no seasoning in it. So we're gonna make everything from scratch, from the cutting and the grating and all of the fun stuff. All right, let's get into it. I've got my cutting board and I've got my sharp knife. Um, I'm gonna suggest we do some of the prep for the burrata first. So also one of the things you need is a sheet tray. So I'm gonna pull out my sheet tray and cut my fresh country loaf. All right, like so. Any bread will work. If you like sourdough, that's fantastic. If you like sliced bread, it will work as well. This is gonna be the base for the burrata cheese. A good crostini is important because while we're making this to go with cheese, if you wanted to do a nice tomato bruschetta or if you want to take mushrooms and make a little bit of a, like a mushroom fricassee or saute of mushrooms, that would work incredibly well in the same kind of a way. Now. There's a couple things that are gonna make this crostini kind of the best crostini, and they're thicker. They're almost, it's like a, you know, in Italy, in Italy they'd call this a crostone, because it's a nice fat slab of bread. And it's like, I love just fresh kind of white bread toasted. The thing that's gonna make this stand out is that we're gonna put a nice, generous dousing of olive oil on there before we toast it. And then when it comes out and it's hot, before we do anything, we're gonna rub it with raw garlic. And that's like a little secret that once I, you know, once you guys see this and try it, I guarantee you, you're gonna rub that on all, it's like a quick and easy garlic bread. And uh, I love that. The next thing with this dish that's really interesting is the way that we roast these grapes and we serve them warm. So it's a really nice, sweet and concentrated counterbalance to the, um, to the creamy and garlicky burrata. So I've washed these, these are red seedless grapes. Uh, sometimes I mix them up, like when we're doing this at the restaurant, we'll use green and red, but for simple, you know, for simplicity, we're just gonna use uh, some red grapes. So what I wanna do is I wanna, now that I've washed them, I'm gonna use a, uh, some scissors, and I'm gonna cut them into clusters, but I'm gonna leave them on the stem. And, uh, you know, I remember when we did this dish 2010 at Campagnolo, people were like, they just were blown away by, by the roasting of the grapes. And it's somehow, I mean, when you think of a great, a great pairing with cheese, grapes should stand out immediately. Why do you keep the stem on? The stem, I keep the stem on merely for aesthetic purposes and for, in the restaurant setting, it's really easy to grab a bunch in a cluster and plate them. If they were all floating around loose, it'd be a mess. So it was just for, for it, was, it was merely, uh, you know, for simplicity and to keep it a little easier. Operational efficiency. Operational efficiency. You know? um, we, we, get, we get it here. But it looks cool operators. too. It look, it just looks cool. So uh, I'm cutting, I don't know, I'm cutting a cup or like a good, a good handful. And then I don't want to put these in just unadorned. I'm going to add 
more olive oil. And if you have a bowl, I toss them in a bowl with salt and pepper. But you know what? If you do them right on the cutting tray, it's all good. It doesn't matter. I use kosher salt or sea salt. I do not like plain iodized salt. So of course, you know, we, we as chefs, you know, the thing that we do well is we season the dishes all the way along so that when they kind of get to the finished product, there's a real depth and balance of flavor. So the salt and pepper kind of, you'll see, I'm gonna be seasoning things all the way, including my pasta water. And that's kind of one of the secrets is understanding how much salt to put in things. That'll kind of up your, up your game in your kitchen. All right, so I've got some slabs of my beautiful white sourdough and I've got my grapes. Uh, what I'm gonna do is put them in the oven and give it a quick toast but I'm not gonna finish this dish because then we're gonna start working on our pasta sauce. All right, so my oven, my oven's set to 395 or 400. If you're at 375, that works as well too. I just find that this oven in my condo is kind of like, it's not the most high powered oven, so I gotta just up it a little bit. So it's important to know what you're working with in your oven. All right, moving along. Let's talk about the ingredients that I'm gonna need for my pasta. So like I said, I've got my beautiful mushrooms. I've got some fresh garlic. I have thyme and basil, okay, fresh. I've got this pappardelle, which comes in a nest. And this is also a little, like a little hidden gem. You know, I buy a lot of dry pasta, but I don't know if you've ever used this that comes in that soft packaging. You ever use these little pappardelle nests or fettuccine nests? I'm, I'm used to, you know, pasta being made from scratch. Like oh, egg, you know, yeah, come on. You, know, you know, fine. I'm, 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 I don't want the, the we, nest. we don't have time. We've got families and work and we, this, is a, this is, what day is it today? Wednesday? You know what? The next class we do will be all about making fresh pasta, right? Flour, water. That's a whole, that's a whole hour in itself, okay? But today I wanted to kind of go over a dish that can be done from start to finish. So we've got a lemon and we've got a little stick of butter. That's gonna help us build that beautiful richness in the sauce. And the first thing I'd like to do is season my pasta water and turn on my, uh, my, my like preheat my pan to build the sauce. So, as I was saying, I use kosher salt uh, or, or, or sea salt. And the thing is, is I have about two to three liters of water in here, but I need to season this aggressively. Some say, oh, you should have your salt, uh, have your wa water taste like the ocean. But in my opinion, the ocean is too salty. That's great for green vegetables, beans or asparagus. But I want this to be a little bit lighter than that. So I'm gonna put about a tablespoon to two tablespoons, like one to two tablespoons, and I'm gonna stir this around and then taste it. And the thing that I always find when I'm cooking at, with people or when I'm cooking at people's houses and I'm just an innocent bystander, I taste their pasta water, it is always under seasoned. And if you don't have enough salt, your pasta will be bland. The finished product will be not where you want it to be. Okay, that's perfect. It's just under, here, I'm, you gotta try this. You want me to taste? I want you to taste because you know what? I don't want Wait, you I'm, to- I'm curious to know like when you're at someone's house, do you, you ask them, can I taste your pasta water? What are the circumstances The circumstances tasting, are like tasting such. Tasting their pasta water. See, you and I are here, we're in a kitchen together. We're drinking wine and we're cooking and inevitably people just hang out and we all have these open kit concept kitchens and we're just, and them, you know, friends and whomever family that know I'm a chef, they'll always say, oh, how's, you know, how's the sauce? Right. Or, what what am I doing feedback. wrong? They, they want, want feedback. feedback. They want me to help them, you know, step things up. So you'll see all the way along today how I kind of build this really simple sauce. So now that we've got the salted water going. That big pot, which is about two thirds full. So that's two to three liters of water I put about two to three tablespoons in, heaping tablespoons. A lot. It's a lot. I'm, you're gonna think it's a lot, but is that, is that a fair statement that it's just below seawater in salt? It, I would say that's yeah. a very fair, very okay. accurate. So see, if you get it to sea salt, like, you know, sea salt levels, that's too, that's too far. Because it is gonna, the pasta will spend six minutes in that pot. Okay, I'm gonna preheat this one now, which is where we're gonna build the sauce. I'm gonna preheat this to uh, three quarter heat. So I'm giving this a six out of 10 or a seven out of 10. And I'm gonna make sure I got both rings on. And in the meantime, I'm gonna prep my mushrooms. I'm not sure what you guys are working with and what you got, it doesn't really matter. Any mushrooms will work. And again, how we cut them isn't hugely important, but I'm gonna take my creminis and I'm just gonna give them slices. And I want them to be not super thin, but it can be rustic. Again, I may, I may just quarter some. I may 
quarter another and take these maitakis. They're on the stem. I love wild mushrooms right now. You can get nice chanterelles. And like I was saying, truffle. did you ever have any of the truffle dinners that we did? I did, they were quite good. You know, truffles are a really beautiful. Do we have any here? Do we don't have, have any it's, fresh it's not truffle season going, right now. I know, no, I know. You know you can, truffle season you, is in the you, fall. You know people, fall. you know, I know people, people that can get some. Yeah, the, I know, the, the black market truffles. Yeah. Um, yeah, truffles are like, they're like the holy grail of cooking and they're rare and they're expensive. They're foraged still to this day by usually well-trained dogs in the forests around Barolo and central and northern Italy. You can take an entire trip to go hunt truffles and eat dishes created by them. I was in Italy on my honeymoon in September and a little early for oh. truffle season, but let's just say in Tuscany, my wife got sick of truffles. It was, it was a lot. Oh my it was, God. There was a that's lot of a, delicious dishes. I have yet to do that. Uh, all the times I've been to Italy, I've yet to go truffle hunting and enjoy that. So that's on my list for sure. So you can see. Sorry? Not, it was not recently, but it, 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 September. oh, in a, in September, like September of not like last September. 2017. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, September. Pretty, that's pretty recently. Yeah, we're nearing on four years. It's, it's been lovely. Awesome. How long have you been married for? Seven years. Seven. Yeah, seven there years. There you go. So it's important to get the pot and your, or your pan nice and hot because we want to, we want to sear these mushrooms. We want to caramelize the mushrooms. And I'm sorry, I keep looking at the, uh, the laptop, but we are directly ahead. And now we're gonna add some olive oil. So I use a little extra virgin olive oil. You'll notice my liberal use of olive oil. It's okay, it's healthy, and it's gonna make these taste delicious, these dishes. So I put a, what did I put in there? A tablespoon, because this, this pasta will get a little butter too. Olive oil and butter, that combo, nothing wrong with it. We're building flavor here. So I've got a nice pile of mushrooms. I, I, I'm gonna go a bit further actually. I think I'm gonna just even add a few more because I'm not just cooking for myself, I'm cooking for you. I appreciate that. And we also have Jason and Christy on our marketing team who are very hungry. Do we have to make, I have to make four? Okay, I mean, all right. Look. Okay, okay, guys, now we're it's in the third year here to cook for four, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm just gonna add a little bit more to my pile and then I am going to fire these in the pan. Okay, warmer pan, get a little sizzle, that's kind of perfect, crank this up. So now that my mushrooms are in there, I'm gonna turn it up all the way to max, and I'm gonna make sure that this pot is boiling because I had it down, so everything's on high right now. And don't forget, we still have the grapes and the bread in the oven. So I'm gonna pull them out and give them a little quick check. No, they're fine, I mean, you want these grapes to be sort of almost bursting, like a, mm. cher like a roasted cherry tomato, and you want that bread to be toasted. We're not there at all. So I'm gonna fire them back in and just leave them alone and let them do their thing. Craig, is there anything I can do to help, or am I just here for- You wanna help? You know what you could do? Whatever, you, whatever you'd like me if to you help. Could, if you could uh, peel the garlic out of yeah. the clove. Yeah, it's man. one of my least favorite jobs. I got it, I got you. I'll give you a tiny little knife if you wanna cut the tops off. Okay. Okay? Cool. My wife says I never do anything around the kitchen, and well, you know listen, I'm, now, gonna, I'm, at, I'm trying to add prove, value here. You are proving this, you know, proving her wrong. Yeah, Ten yeah everyone, I can see some people doing their wow, thing. Wow, we have someone with a with a beautiful apron. Who's that? I love it. Yes. Okay. So in the meantime, we're going to start getting the rest of our ingredients ready here. Let me move these mushrooms out of the way. Okay. So. Burrata cheese. I want to do one thing before we assemble this dish and that is to, I'm cutting open the container and I'm dumping out the whey because the thing about burrata and fresh mozzarella, you do not want to eat them fridge cold. It does not enhance, you know, having them come to room temperature enhances not only the texture, but the flavor. It becomes creamy, it becomes soft, and, uh, and you definitely want them to be at room temp. So this has been out for the better part of an hour, co probably coming up on an hour and a half now, okay? So I've drained the whey and my cheese is sitting there nicely. So I'm gonna move on to the parm. The, the parm is gonna be a big aspect of this pasta dish. And what I mean by that is it's going to 
be, it's going to be emulsified and, and blended into the sauce. And how we grate it is very important. This is a typical box grater. You've got the large one for your mozzarellas, your cheddars. You have the medium one. But what you want is this rough one at the back. I call this the Nona setting. This is where, you know, and I know my name's Craig Harding, but I come from a half Italian background. I have a Nona. And that's my connection to Italy and why I love Italian food so much and why we're doing this menu today. So this is the Nona setting on the grater. And when you see, when I start grating it, it comes off almost sandy in sort of little granular pieces. And if I was to go with the big one, the cheese would never melt properly into my sauce of wa pasta water, butter, and mushroom. So. Does that make sense? Do you do this? I was using the wrong side of the knife, so I actually you am. You didn't have useless. to admit. Is, you didn't have to admit that, but you. This I is confusing. Is it? Yeah, I would. I I put my finger here, and I thought this was. I'm so glad you didn't slice your finger Can we open. See right here, I I thought that this was the, and this, but no. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I was wondering why it wasn't cutting. Oh my God. What, what type of knife is this? Jeez. That's called a. It's called a turning knife. That is a knife for, it's a paring knife with an angle, but it's a knife that you would use to peel peel mushrooms, peel garlic, anyhow. We're okay, you're safe? Yeah, I'm safe, thank you're you, safe. I okay. appreciate it. As I was getting, saying here with this cheese, I'm grating it on the, on the very small one of the box grater. And can you see the outcome here? You see how that's sandy? Lovely. That's what you want. I hope you don't grate your parm on this one, Adam. No. Okay. Uh, okay. No, good. no parm grating. All right. Perfect. Perfect. You so know this what? Is, you know what I grate parm on most frequently? Microplane. I will. My most frequent parm dish, my go-to these days, yeah. is I'll just do scrambled eggs with sliced avocado and parm. Oh, that's, I'll uh, do that. That's like my weekend no, breakfast. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm just gonna get in here and agitate my mushrooms yet, or I, I haven't added any salt or anything, but this is gonna help me. It's gonna just help me get a nice even caramelization because the minute I put salt in there, it's gonna draw all the water out and I will not get any brown, yeah, I won't get any brown color or, or that like that rich flavor because in caramelization comes flavor. So when you're searing a steak or browning mushrooms uh, or onions for that matter, caramelizing onions, you get that really rich sort of nutty toasted sugar. Car I mean, if you can believe it, mushrooms actually do have um, some sugar in them so that they, they, they develop that caramel. It's like, a, it's a, it's a, it's called, if you want to get technical, we call that the Maillard reaction and it creates um, like an umami quality uh, on the surface and builds a lot of flavor in whatever you're, you're making, which is why food off the grill tastes just so, so good. Craig, I've done a uh, below average job with these garlics. That's okay. But they're they're but ready to go. You've left a lot of skin on there though. Wait, I have. Skin. You want me all skin off? Skin off. All skin we need off. all skin off. We're gonna need three cloves for the pasta and one clove for the burrata dish. So as you can see, I can, I'm continually grating here and I'm at about one cup. So for two portions of pasta, it's gonna be about one cup of cheese. So one cup, I'm even at a cup and a half. You can't go wrong with the parm, adding a little extra parm is gonna add so much flavor to this. Okay, look at that, perfect. I'm gonna set this aside and now that that's done, I can move on to preparing my garlic in my thyme because now we need to take care of these mushrooms a little bit. We need to like get the flavor going in it. So fresh thyme and mushrooms is a match made in heaven. So I'm gonna take out a couple sprigs of thyme and I'm gonna just use my hands and pull the, the woody part of the sprig through my fingers and take each little leaf off because I don't wanna put all this tough, you know, uh, the tough woody part of the herbs. I just want these delicate little leaves, okay? And thyme leaves are good. And the thing about thyme is that it lasts forever in your fridge. Sometimes I hate buying fresh herbs because they go off so quickly before I can use them. But thyme and rosemary, but especially thyme is one of those things that goes with, it goes with meats and fish and eggs and mushrooms. And so you can use it on a variety of different ingredients and it also lasts considerably longer than things like basil or parsley. So I'm a big advocate of keeping some fresh thyme on hand. So 
I'm now onto my fifth sprig. And if you get some big pieces of stem in there, it's okay because I'm gonna run my knife through them. So now that I've got this on the board, I'm just gonna do a quick rough chop, get my knife going through it. A little stem is totally fine as long as it's not the toughest, woodiest part on the bottom. And now that I have about a tablespoon, I am gonna put that right in my mushrooms. And I'm, I'm gonna start seasoning them now. So I'm gonna grab some salt, the pinch in my hands, and I'm gonna sprinkle that in, about a teaspoon, maybe I'll put a teaspoon and a half, and some fresh cracked pepper. Very important, fresh pepper is very important. And now I'm gonna check on my burrata and grapes. So multitasking is, is, is really important in, you know, if you wanna get a dinner off together, it's important to kind of make sure it's all coming out at the same time. So my grapes are pretty much done. My Cristini's halfway there. It's not browned yet, but it's definitely starting to get a little toasty and hard. So I'm gonna put this off to the side and when I get my, um, pasta in the water, I might put that back in the oven to just give it a jolt of heat to help finish it off. So, garlic, garlic is garlic good to is go. Garlic is ready, chef, yes. Okay. Can everybody see these mushrooms? They're nice and caramelized. There's fresh thyme in there. It's time to get the garlic in. I don't wanna make sure my, controlling the heat is very important. So I'm gonna grab some cloves of garlic here. Uh, I'll take maybe, since they vary in size, I'll take one big one, one medium and two small. So there'll be three cloves of garlic. And I'm just gonna go and run my knife through it and I'm gonna slice these. They don't need to be perfect, but the slicing it allows for cooking time without burning. If you mince your garlic or if you make it really rough chopped, you're gonna end up burning some and then it gets bitter. So I'm a big fan of larger chunks, but sliced. In most of the pastas that we do at the restaurant, we always add a sliced garlic and we use a mandolin but if you've ever had the spaghetti alla matriciana or other things, the sliced garlic just keeps it, it keeps it from getting bitter and burnt on the edges. Okay, so now that my garlic is in there, so guys, I've got the thyme, the garlic, oil, salt, pepper, and mushrooms. We're gonna add the pasta into the water now. So I'm using pappardelle. This is an egg noodle, but it's dried and it comes in this little loose sort of a, clamshell and they're nested. So I'm gonna assume two of these are a portion. So I'm gonna fire one portion in, two portions, and I'll just do three. And you know what, I'll just put the last one in and we'll figure that out, we'll make it work. And now I can kind of go on to the next couple of things here. I'm saving one piece of garlic for my burrata and I've got some chives here and I've got fresh basil. So I'm going to take the basil and I give it a rinse actually because you know basil and herbs can get a little sandy sometimes. So I give that a rinse and I'm going to pull the leaves off and set them aside and that's how we're going to finish the pasta. So while I'm adding a few extra mushrooms into my sauce, I'll give everybody a chance to catch up. So you should have, you should have some mushrooms sauteing in olive oil. You should have your pasta in your water and the pasta takes about six minutes and it's important to get your tongs and agitate it because you don't want this sort of sticking situation that if you were just to drop your pasta and leave it and walk away, it can easily stick together. But if you just give it a little love and attention and you run the, you run the tongs through there, it really helps to cook evenly, all right? I, you know, I get excited. Let me play sommelier for our next wine. Yeah, yeah, why don't you talk about what so, we're drinking So here? we're drinking a Vino de Noble de Multipachano. So for people that are not familiar with Multipachano, a Multipachano de Bruzzo is actually not from Multipachano. Multipachano is a city in Tuscany that's right near Multicino. And many people may know Multicino for their Brunellos. Brunellos are a big, beautiful, 100% Sangiovese wine. And Multipachano and Vino de Nobles are also 100% Sangiovese. Just for whatever reason in this hierarchy of regions in Tuscany, it's been a very forgotten wine. 
And so if ever you're at a wine store and you're looking at wines from Tuscany and Brunello's are like 90 or $100, Vino de Nobles are the sister city right beside Montalcino. And you can usually get them for significantly cheaper, but just as delicious as Brunello. Would you agree? You really crushed that. Yeah? I mean, yeah, I would totally agree. Okay. Uh, you nailed let's it. Let's drink some. Yeah, let's yeah. have some. Let's yeah. Look at that. Just, just mic drop. Here we go. I didn't know you had that in you. Craig, I like to drink wine and eat food, man. I, I, we, we went through this at the beginning. Vino Noble. Yeah. And the name is just, ooh, this is good. This is a really beautiful bouquet. I think Sangiovese is nice. It's got a sweetness on the nose. The Sangiovese grape is also the main grape in Chianti. Um, so it's really, you know, prevalent throughout central uh, Italy from, you know, Rome all the way up to Parma. Very nice, very nice. Okay, some of the things that I'm gonna need to finish this off are, like I said, some chives, some lemon, that one raw garlic, and of course I've got a stick of butter. I'm gonna set aside about a half a stick of butter for this. That's not too much, is it? I, more butter, the better. The more butter, the better. I think that people that don't use enough butter are doing themselves a disservice. A hundred percent. And yeah. delicious. You wanna know why your food at a restaurant is delicious? Because <laughs> the chef uses a lot of butter. Yeah. And you wanna know why your food at home doesn't, isn't as delicious? Because you don't use enough butter. Salt, butter, and olive oil. Heat, salt, and fat. That is the secret to cooking things properly. Okay, I'm still kind of cooking. This, the noodles are taking some time, which is okay. Um, I've, got my, uh, I've got my grapes sort of chilling here. And because I'm so close to getting everything finalized and on the plate, I'm gonna put my bread, now that it's been out for a minute, I'm gonna put the bread and grapes back in because I do wanna get a nice brown toasted crust on them. So, bread and grapes go back in. Pasta's in the water. Here's my next secret for making great pasta, and that is, I'm gonna need a mug for this. And I'll tell you why I need a mug, because I wanna collect some of this starchy, beautiful water out of my pasta pot before I drain it. So I'm gonna put my mug in and collect a full mug of pasta water, okay? So my mug of pasta water is gonna hang out over here, and that's gonna go into my finished sauce it's going to thicken things. It's gonna develop this velvet, coupled with the Parmesan cheese, the lemon juice, and the butter, it's gonna make it a beautiful finished pasta sauce here, okay? So can so, I ask a question? If you were making a red sauce, would you do the same thing? I would, I would, because sometimes you work with tomatoes, you know, you make this sauce, you may not cook it down enough. It helps to actually, it helps to just the starchiness will thicken the whole thing and bring it together. But there's also the second thing there is that you pull the pasta a touch early and you put your pasta in the pot and then adding the water and cooking everything together, starch is released from the pasta in your red sauce when you're cooking in this pot that I'm building my sauce out of. I just, I never understood why people would drain the noodles, put the noodles on the plate and then dump sauce on. It is such a, it is a real disservice, uh, I, that was a great word that you used, to actually making like an, an, a, a, an authentic sauce. I don't know where we got this idea, you know, from food styling in the 90s that that was how we made pasta, but it is not. It needs to be, the sauce and the noodles need to, they need to hang out. They need to kind of share with each other. I get it, man. Okay, so it's kind of hard to overdo these uh, mushrooms because the, the more you cook them, the more color, the better, the deeper the flavor. Craig, how do you know when a pasta is al dente? The only way you know, good question. The only way you know, so a timer is one way to have a base point. Yeah. But you gotta taste it. Okay, so look, you're gonna. What do we think we're at right here? Can Drop you handle it? that? It's hot. Yeah, I it's got hot. it. I got it. So I feel like we're 85% of the way there. It's nice how salty the pasta is, you can tell from the, from the water. See what I mean? It's I not too tell. salty. Oh. It's perfectly seasoned. Yeah. And the right way to serve it is al dente? Of course, Suzanne, come al on. Al dente, with the tooth, just a light toothsome bite. This is, okay. too, this is far too much, but it's important to taste. If you're not tasting, you'll never know. You cannot go by just what it says on the box. 
The box is merely- So there's no way to figure out just by like the flimsiness you always have to taste. Well, like that's the I, best can, way to do it. I have a bit of a sense. Yeah. But for the person that's making this at home tonight and for the future, always taste it. I would typically taste my pasta. And <laughs> al dente, for those that don't know, means- the Firm, not mushy. Toothsome bite. There you go. Firm, not mushy. <laughs> so. We're close, we're close. Now I'm gonna add some butter. So what did I say, half a, half a stick. Okay, we're gonna start with half a stick. Because I might save a quarter of a stick for, um, for the finishing. So I got my half a stick in there, and I'm gonna take my whole lemon, and one of my trusted tools that I use is a microplane. It's a kind of one of a, it's like a desert island chef's tool. Very, um, very important, I can, I can take fresh uh, cinnamon sticks and I can grate that on top of food. I can take the zest of lemon, orange, lime on a cocktail. Why would you use that over the cheese grater for the lemon? Because it won't, I don't get enough rind off of this. Got it. And if I go on this side, I'm getting too much. I'm mm. getting the bitter pith. Mm. But this microplane was formulated to take just the surface layer of rind off. So I'm gonna just do this. Run this. And you can just smell it immediately, the oils. I mean, get in here. I, I want you to just be part of this. I do, I do smell it It's so nice, yeah, right? Good. And you can just see it takes off just the right amount. It's almost just a fraction of it. I don't want that bitter pith in there, but I also want the juice. So in my opinion, the rind is as valuable as the juice in a kitchen and in a culinary aspect, okay? So now that I've got half the rind off, I'm gonna give that a slice. I'm gonna put it back on here. I'm gonna add a small amount of my water, just a tablespoon or two, okay? And if you have some white wine open in your fridge, splash the white wine in there. It's not necessary, but it is fun and it can be beneficial. Why, now, why is white wine and mushroom a common thing? It's, um, why do those it's complement each other? Because typically there's butter in with mushrooms or cream, and yeah. the white wine is that nice acidity, it's a nice depth of flavor, it's all about creating a balance mm -hmm. between you know the rich fats and the light acidity, which is why lemon also works. So it could be white wine and lemon, but white wine works in that way, it brings freshness. Got it. It brings freshness to a, ri to the, a, a, a what would be otherwise rich dish. Okay. Okay? So, I'm gonna take half my lemon, I don't think, I actually think this is quite seedless, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna juice. Okay, and I don't need to worry about seeds. And we're just gonna let that, let that sit and start to see a thick sauce forming, okay? And when I add my noodles in, which I feel like we're getting to that point, if when I add these noodles in, they're gonna contribute to that thickness. I can almost tell just by looking at this that it's ready to go. Here, you ready to yes, have please. another hot yeah, noodle? Sure. I know it's tough, it's toasty. So. I think we're good, man. I think we're good too, Definitely right? Good. Okay. Would you mind straining that pasta water for me? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, no problem. So now it's the, where we add the Parmesan cheese and the basil. So when the pasta goes in, it's gonna cook for a little bit, but then the final thing we do is we're gonna add just a touch more butter. So now we're up to three quarters of a stick. So I'm gonna add my final little, we'll call this a little knob of butter and my nice, cup to cup and a half of grated parm, and it's gonna make the sauce so creamy and so velvety. And I saved my pasta water so Adam can drain it all off, not a problem. And I'm gonna take this over here. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. All right, so drain off the excess water and into my sauce. Perfect. Okay, back on the heat now. So we're still sitting at three quarter, we're still sitting at three quarter heat, and I wanna add another two to three tablespoons of pasta water, okay? And if you don't mind, would you just agitate it yeah. and just yeah, sort of, yeah, you yeah. know, get the flavors melding and coming together and developing. You know, we've worked really hard at that sauce, but now we need it to coat the pasta nicely. Which brings me back to that reason why we don't put b plain pasta on the plate and put the sauce on, because it needs to work together and develop in that pan, all right? So now it's time, now's the time for the burrata to happen. So I'm gonna go into my oven and I'm gonna pull out my bread and my 
roasted grapes that should be just perfectly, perfectly warm and exploding with kind of caramelized sweetness. So my, my crostini's browning on the edges and toasting and quite, quite crunchy and my grapes are changing color and they're warm and uh, that, you know, you can see like that little salt on the surface sort of kind of hanging out and developing. It's, it's yeah, they're soft, but not, they haven't exploded yet, okay? So I'm gonna grab a plate because now we're gonna build the cheese and the burrata on here. So I'm gonna put the two pieces of sourdough on here. And if you think we've done enough, enough yeah, here, I'm just gonna good. pull it off to the side. Let's do that. Okay, I'm gonna pull this off to the side. I'm gonna add my extra water. So I, the, la the thing I also find with people that are making pasta at home that haven't done it a lot is that the pasta gets really dry. And the pasta water will kind of just keep it at that perfect moisture level, the perfect consistency of sauce. And for everyone that doesn't know, Craig's restaurant, formerly Campagnolo, this dish, this burrata dish, for I would say the better part of a decade in Toronto was the top 10 most Instagram dish in the city. <laughs> it was, it wasn't. If, 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 you, if you want a classic Toronto dish by a incredible chef and an operator of restaurants, this burrata, this is famous in Toronto. Like warm grapes on a on a crostini with burrata yeah, is like just, every <laughs> single home in Toronto is making this dish because of Craig <laughs> here. Know, thank so, you. So so everyone should know that this is like this this is this has changed lives in Toronto oh, yeah. and bring it to your cities across the U.S. today. Hey, you know what? I try. I'm glad to impart this thing with you. It is this this perfect convulgence of like or convergence of these simple things that just come together and it's like salty and creamy and sweet and garlicky and it just works so well. So these toasted crostini, while they're hot, it's important. And I rub on it raw peeled garlic, okay? And you'll notice that crusty bread just picks up like raw shards of garlic in here. And it's like, you can smell that. It's just such a beautiful thing, okay? Raw garlic on this toast. This is something you will not forget and you will do this. I promise you, the next time you make a crostini, you're gonna be doing this. Okay, I'm gonna grab one of my beauty, I have, actually I have two burrata here. So these are each 125 grams. So I'm gonna lay this on top and just open it. It's so delicate, it, it's so creamy. It's this beautiful stretched mozzarella that is filled with cream and curd, which is called stracciatella all these amazing Southern Italian ingredients. I that, almost, that's stracciatella, that's what stracciatella cheese that's is. That's what stracciatella cheese is. Oh my, it's the I, inside I actually of the, had no idea. Now you know. Yeah. So if you ever see stracciatella cheese, it's, uh, it's the inside of burrata. And sometimes you see stracciatella ice cream and it's because they've modeled it after this fresh creamy dairy. But usually that's with like chocolates. The, and the, then, the then they add chocolate gelato. in it, yeah. So I've got cheese opened up on, on, the, on the crostini. I'm gonna get my, trusty spoon to now take these hot grapes and I'm just gonna lay them around. And that's why you see the clusters work so well. It's a presentation point. Not only is it easy to plate, but it just looks cool on top of this cheese. It like, it feels like somehow natural, okay? And just not too fussed with. And that's why I think Italian food is so special because we don't, we don't mess with things too much. For the team right here. Did you cut the burrata in half or just like I just, it I just gently opened it with my fingers. I just gently kind of, you know, kept some integrity but exposed the inside, that creamy interior. So that was important. I wanted you to see the creamy interior. Well, okay. You, got, you haven't done anything with the Parmesan yet, right? No, Parmesan is going to go in to finish off the pasta. So. The thing I want to do now is season the burrata. So I'm going to put a little salt on here and I'm going to put a little salt on the other one. And then some fresh pepper. Okay. Put it back over here and then I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut some chives. And the reason I don't do basil, while it would be delicious, is it's going to take over. When you put basil on something, it's the star of the show almost, mm. right? And I love it, but I want the star of the show to be this like beautiful balance, as I was saying, of garlicky, creamy, and sweet. So I've cut some chives. I'm gonna sprinkle them on top. 
and then we're gonna finish it with olive oil and then our dish is done. So once you kind of go through this method, you can see how simple this is to put together. And of course, I am not, as I was saying either, I'm not gonna be shy. Generous olive oil. Generous. 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 This is the elixir of the gods. If you wouldn't mind, we'll just slide this over here. I don't know if you guys can see, but we're gonna leave that there. And now, now we're gonna go back to the pasta. So is everybody at this point, does everybody have their noodles in their sauce? Okay. Well, you know, I saved a full mug of, of water, but I'm gonna say now, look, uh, it's, is, it not a, is it not just a, maybe a touch dry? I don't know, I have no idea. Okay, I'm gonna you, say- You tell me. I'm gonna say that it is. Okay, so okay. What, how will you make it not I'm gonna dry? go to the tap. Tap water? Yeah, tap water, That's it's cool. okay. Okay, Why? how do you know it's dry? That like that pasta looks glistening to me. If you told me, is this, is this pasta glistening and damp, I would have said yes. Well, how do you know it's dry? I'll tell you why it's dry, because I know that when I add all this cheese, yeah. it's gonna absorb everything. Got it. So I need to kind of, I need to have this pasta on the looser side before I do the final part of this, which is butter and parm, okay? So that's why I'm gonna add, I'm just gonna keep a touch of water over here. So I'm not, not adding much, not adding much. So once I get the heat back through it, it's time to finish it. So I'm gonna basically turn this down to like, a quarter, like minimal. And I'm gonna put that last nub of butter. So now we're in for about three quarters of a stick. And I'm gonna get my basil and I'm gonna put on my board and just give it a rough, we call this a chiffonade. And again, I'm slicing it. I'm not pounding it. You could also just tear it in there because the, the more you handle the basil, the more you cut it, the more pressure it bruises it and it just takes the fresh flavor away, right? So I'm gonna just lay that nice, gently cut basil in there. You can smell the basil. You can smell it. You're right because it's 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 not it's not been uh, over over handled. And so now that I've got this all going in, I'm gonna put I'm gonna leave a little bit for the top. But the reason I turn this down is you don't want to boil the cheese. You want the cheese to go in just at that perfect part where it's just warmed. And I've got my half lemon here, right? So I put a half lemon in, but I think we're gonna need a touch more lemon. So what I'm gonna do is taste my sauce because I haven't really tasted this yet. So, mm, good though. But I think it's missing some acid. Okay. So I'm gonna give it another fresh squeeze of lemon. And that's the thing about building flavor in a pasta is that you have to, add things maybe multiple times and maybe you taste you maybe you taste through it and you feel where it's at now it's much better just that extra little bright brightness and now that I'm agitating this pasta and I'm turning it I don't know if the camera will show this but starch from the pasta and I you know and if you've ever seen in a restaurant chefs just flipping it in the pan almost for for you know for a show there's a reason for that because the more you the more you you do what they call in Italy a mantecato, it means to mount the pasta and create and rub that like that starch will come off of it. So when you when you see chefs going like this and sautéing, it's it's to build it's to build that texture in the dish. There's a reason for it, but it does look friggin' cool as well when you're sitting in the chef's bar, and the chefs are full steam ahead flipping saucepans. It's a nice thing, right? Suzanne, you like how he did that clean mid. Mid, uh, yes. mid flip. Mid flip clean. You notice the clean? Okay. Even a little touch more water. Beautiful. And that's why we put the pasta in the sauce and develop it in the pan. Okay, and I wish you could smell this because you've got basil and lemon and garlic and it's really coming together here. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go to two bowls and I'm gonna plate this up because we're in the home stretch here. Does anybody have any last minute thoughts? Is everybody along with me? Are we at the same point? Did I just rip through this like a, you know? I learned a lot, Craig. Did you learn a lot? I did learn a okay. lot. Okay, okay. All right. So, now the secret is to plate this up nicely. So I use my tongs and I grab a little bundle, I grab that 
and I bring it down and I create that nest. So I'm, it's kind of the process going back to its original form, nested, bundled, beautiful. Why didn't you choose to plate it in a bowl rather than a plate? I just, I don't know. I just like the aesthetic of a bowl that's kind of has a wide top and a narrow bottom. It just sort of showcases it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it it'll funnel any sauce because this isn't a very saucy pasta, right? But it'll funnel any sauce down to the bottom. I don't want to have it wasted on a bowl, like on a plate where it's running off the sides. Okay. And the thing I love about this is that we didn't have any prep to do. We didn't add too, too much dairy, even though there's quite a bit of butter. I think this is on the lighter side. I might even get a third one here because we have guests and we've got to take care of our people and feed who's around, but we've got lots of burrata. So that's good. So I'm going to finish this off. The other, yeah. thi the other thing about this dinner is that it's vegetarian. And I think it's interesting to note that you can really make a satisfying meal that's rich and flavorful without eating a ton of meat. I know that I'm eating more plant-based these days and less meat. Okay. Finish it off. Don't you have a plant-based cheese that you're working on as well? Good. Good call it. Thank you for that, Adam. Yes. So, uh, uh, you know, with the downturn of the restaurants this year, I had the opportunity to develop a line of plant-based cheeses. And so I'm part of a company called The Future of Cheese, which I'm hoping will show up on Instacart in the next little while. And in major Suzanne, retailers. we have to launch in Canada to get Craig as an advertiser. There we go. Okay. I was going to say, is it in the US? Not no, yet. not yet. But this is my first foray into consumer packaged goods. And... Um, We've developed a line of uh, products made with cashews and cultured and surface ripened brie's and butters and, and cream cheeses and mozzarella. And I'm so thrilled and proud. And I never thought I would get excited about plant-based, but when I tasted what was out there and I saw the direction that the market was going, I knew I had to come up with something and I, I knew there was a room to get in and give it that real chef perspective. What, what cheese, what non-plant-based cheese is it most similar to, would you say? That's the thing. If I put the brie on a cheese board beside cow's brie from France, the, my, my, my out goal is to, that you wouldn't know so the difference. So it's creamy like brie. It's you're, creamy you're like brie, yeah. yeah. And um, this is it, folks. I mean, we've got a, a beautiful burrata with grapes, roasted, garlicky, creamy. We've got mushroom pappardelle, lemon, butter, parmigiano, and fresh basil. I have some extra chives cut. I might as well just, you know, add that on, top it off. And we can sit down and enjoy a really made from scratch dinner that I think the next time you do this could be done in 30 minutes. I hope I've imparted Why some. Why thirty? This was this. this we went draw we went it out. Fast. No, you're right. You're right. Draw it out. Draw it out. Take the way we built the sauce. If you want to sub the mushrooms out, asparagus or peas. I love or peas. Or spinach, like yeah. th it's endless. It's endless. I just wanted this to be a conceptual way to build a great sauce for a simple pasta dish. And when everything, when stuff comes available, you know, when seasons change and springs upon us, go nuts. Go to the market and have fun with it. Thank you, everyone. It's been great working yeah. with you. And if we don't work with you, hit up Hillary, Hillary at Draper.ai. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.